Thanks for tuning in to the Ambitious Sloth podcast. And today I have a guest, Dennis McCormick, and he wants to tell us uh, his story. Um, and the story of of Dennis really struck me when I heard it the first time um, about his really extreme de- de- determination and willpower. And while so many people, including me, are basically waiting for a perfect moment to start something or uh, maybe have an excuse of not doing something. Um, Dennis did not think that, uh, but instead he, uh, despite the sayings of the doctors, um, did not stop trying to go for what he wanted to achieve. And that's why I'm super excited and curious to hear how he managed to fight um sometimes the lack of motivation and um uh, basically to learn from his unbelievably strong mindset so thank you so much for taking the time dennis um and yeah. being now on my podcast yeah not a problem happy to be here um yeah i guess the easiest would be if you um quickly say something about yourself like what what do you do right now and then we continue with uh, your story Yeah. Um, well, I uh, currently now I'm uh, a marketing director for a multi-million dollar company. Um, it was not always the case, uh, obviously, with my accident. So um, being able to be in the position and work for the type of company that I do now is kind of a blessing. Um, I guess the, uh, the the story of my accident that even brought up that in is that I uh, I was run over by a truck. Um, I was in a, a motorcycle accident and I was broadsided by um, a full size SUV, um, uh, totaled the truck even. Um, and the, the extent of my injuries led the hospital to meet my family at the door with the, the church or the hospital chaplain to come give me my last rites because they thought I was going to die. Oh, wow. So it was right after the accident that critical that they thought you weren't even able to to continue to live correct they uh, uh right uh, immediately during the accident um my brain hemorrhage um it swelled up and i had a, a pocket of blood in my brain that they had to dry or drain out and um when i got to the hospital and they had drained that it actually did it a second time and Uh, my skull had fractured and shattered and there was fragments in my brain embedded that they had to do a craniotomy where they, they quite literally remove part of my skull. I have a scar that just swoops down where I now I have two titanium plates instead of a skull. Um, and they, my grandmother was the one who was closest to the hospital. Um, and they, they called my grandma and they met her at the door at, of the hospital to, you know, kind of brace her for the fact that I was going to die, and that uh, if I was religious, that I should, you know, have somebody come give me my last rites um, before I passed away. Wow. But luckily, they managed to to keep you alive. And uh... yeah, I'm uh, they after the second brain hemorrhage, um, they did the craniotomy, like I said, and they, they removed yeah. my skull. But I had uh, I had a deflated lung. I had uh, a shattered collarbone and the damage to my left leg was um, causing um, to cause them to put in a rod to stabilize it and then place four more rods in with uh, basically like scaffolding to keep it from moving. Um, and it's one of those things where if they were going to do one surgery, they might as well do them all, um, uh, essentially because they weren't, or they're pretty sure that my body wouldn't be able to handle it. Most people's wouldn't. Um, so I was, uh, I, I was in a coma after the second brain hemorrhage. And so while I was in the coma, they went ahead and did, um, a surgery on my shoulder. Um, I had a deflated lung and a retinal detachment. So they sewed my eye socket back in. Um, they put in a nerve block into my shoulder, um, put a plate in there, um, and then went ahead along with the external fixation of my leg all in one go. Um, and I, I just kind of remember waking up and, um, it was kind of in and out and I, I, I have short term memory issues, but the, the fact that I even woke up 
was kind of a miracle. Um, my, my dad actually keeps a picture of me in my coma as the background on his phone as a reminder to him. Oh, wow. And for, for how long have you been into this coma? Uh, I was in the coma for 15 days. Um, 12 of them were a standard coma and then three of them were medically induced. Oh, so, oh, sorry. I thought, I thought all of them were medically induced. No, no, no. I was after the second brain hemorrhage, I didn't wake up. Um, and then, um, when I started coming to, after they did the nerve block on my shoulder, I started to come awake after that. So, um, they placed me in a medically induced coma for three more days. And so during all that time, they did all the surgeries and tried to then somehow put your body together again. Yeah. The, I not only was it bones, but I had snapped my patellar tendon. I had meniscus housing that completely ruptured my ACL tear, MCL tear. Um, my leg, the way that it broke, usually it would break below the knee. Mine actually broke above the knee. So the way that the tendons would normally be repaired, there wasn't as much surface area in order for that to happen. So they actually thought it would be better just to take my leg off, just amputate it. Um, they uh, after they did the surgery, um, to attempt to keep it, um, I, I was stuck in what they call that external fixator, that scaffolding attached all the, the pins and rods. So I can't bend it at all. In order to lift my leg, you have to quite literally grab onto the scaffolding and pull your leg up in order to move it. Um, and after so many months um, all the over a year of that and the rehabilitation, the doctor in, um, Dr. Hobie Summers, an incredible surgeon, um, had me, you know, doing range of motion and asked me to lift my leg. And the very first time I did it, I'll never forget the look of shock on his face of just, Oh, okay. He goes, I didn't actually expect that to happen. You know, I didn't, he didn't actually expect the surgery to work, um, because of how damaged it was and how little, uh, uh, ability he had to to repair it and so they did the surgery without even thinking that it was possible to to restore it yeah. correct they they knew that you know it might help but there was no it was a long shot essentially um and there was no way of knowing until after all of the pins and rods and everything got taken out because the muscle didn't have any way to bend, so they didn't have any idea if it would actually work or not. Um, I was the the first time that they had attempted the the suturing of the my um, patellar tendon in the place that it was. Um, this is the or the first time that Doctor Summers has ever attached it there. So um, he thought that there there was about a, a seventy percent chance they would have to amputate, let alone keep the leg, let alone walk. So the fact that I not only can walk today, um, I can, I can walk without a cane and I still have pain every single day. Um, but, uh, it's better than, you know, being completely amputated in, in a wheelchair. For sure. For sure. And what, what do you think, or what is for you the most severe thing that happened during that accident? Um, the most severe, I guess, is it would automatically go straight to the brain hemorrhages just because, you know, the, that swelling of the brain, it, it was so, so significant and happened multiple times. And it, you know, even to this day, having these plates in my head, if, if I were, you know, hit relatively hard and where a, a general person might just have a concussion and needs to take it easy and something like that, I would more than likely have another brain hemorrhage and probably pass away. Um, as far as the extent of damage, though, my leg, um, having five plates and so many tendons and muscles completely ripped to shreds. And, um, now having, I have my, my patella is fake. My kneecap, um, is synthetic now. Um, and most of the fluids in that kneecap are synthetic as well. So, you know, that just had so, so many areas that were damaged, but the the damage to my brain probably had the most detrimental impact or at least possibility of being detrimental oh wow okay um but all this even though the doctors also told you that you weren't able to walk afterwards anymore and all the restrictions you have after those accidents didn't didn't keep you away from trying to to walk again trying to get a job again 
Um, no, not at all. That I'm, is, uh... that seems so <laughs> almost ridiculous to me. How, how did you manage to do that to yourself? Well, I think it, it all stemmed even before my accident. Um, I, I'm a Marine, uh, with the United States and the, the mentality that it took, the, the mental toughness that you have. One, I think I was in a better position just because of the, the physical condition that I was in being in the Marine Corps and having to be as physically fit as I was that helped my body be able to react, um, better to such injuries than, uh, say an average person who, who wasn't in that type of physical condition. But on top of that, even before all of that, I'm one of those people that if you tell me that I can't do something, it just pushes me harder. It pushes me to want to do it even more. And it, it's one of those things where I just, I, I'll, I'll never give up at anything. And I'll, there's the only person that can, that can make you quit is you. Nobody else can. And the sooner, that I, I got to working at it, the, the sooner I knew that I could prove everybody else wrong or even more so just prove myself wrong, prove the injury that it, it isn't better than I am. I'm, I'm so much more than just an injury. And even, even the very first day after, um, I was transferred from the ICU to general care, um, I was given a walker and they wanted me to take my first steps, um, with a walker and basically like hopping on one foot. And they said, um, go as far as you can, but you know, don't stress it. If you, you can't do, do any, even that's okay. You're like, we just need to make sure that we get your muscles moving. Well, they expected me to go, you know, two or three steps and the hallway is a square in that, that, that ward of the hospital. Um, I did four laps, um, day one. Um, and mind you, even with, uh, Walker, I also have, uh, a plate. I have plates in my shoulder, um, from okay. where my collarbone shattered. Um, so trying to push my weight onto the Walker too, I was putting pressure on that plate that they had just put in my shoulder too. Um, but even day one, I, I wasn't listening to the do a few steps thing. I said, you told me to go as far as I could. And, despite the pain and anything I was going as far as I could. Um, and like, so that, that day one was the catalyst to going, I'm not listening to any of you to tell me to take it easy. Um, my goal is to get better. And my goal is to live my life. So I'm going to do everything that I can to do that. That sounds just too incredible to, I don't know, where's this coming from? Um, was that, was that always the case also before the Marine that you already had this kind of mentality or did, was it instilled due to Marine Corps? No, I think, I think that it was, it's, it's within everybody. There's just so many things in the world that have told people that hey, you should, you should be careful. You shouldn't, you shouldn't push that. You should live, a, you should live a life that's easy and that makes sense and things like that. But, uh, I, you know, the world doesn't remember mediocre men. The world remembers great men who do great things. And so if there's anything about that, it's not even about the world remembering, but you, you have to live with yourself and what you're going to do and put out into the world. And so I think the being in the Marine Corps helped reinstill that, or at least light a fire under that feeling. But I think every human being on this planet holds that. It's just so many things in the world tell us not to feed into it. And uh, because of that, that's the one personal trait I have. If you tell me not to do something, I'm going to do it. So anybody that tells me that I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't, I shouldn't live so recklessly or something like that. And going, then what's the point of living? If I'm not going to live to the fullest extent that I can live, what's the point? So I made sure that I lived every moment of my recovery as hard and as, as stressful and as, as much accomplishment as I could feed into it as I could. And what, what also struck me was you you still say yeah i i want to fight against all these uh odds and what p people tell but especially if for example doctors tell you something that you yeah. you should you weren't allowed uh, able to walk anymore or you probably not going to do this anymore how how even getting above those um yeah sayings or what they do i mean the 
the relevancy I think of it is that a, a doctor, right, is a doctor for a reason. They're the, in the very educated, very skilled individual who's put in a lot of effort and time into what they are practicing as a job. But, um, in the end, I, I had to kind of remind myself is that they're, they may be a doctor, but they're not me. So they're referencing my injury from a textbook and from experience of other people. Well, I'm not other people. I don't want to be other people. I'm, I'm not on this planet to be other people. I'm on this planet to be me. And so if he's going to tell me that I can't do it, well, you're right. Maybe somebody else can't, but that, how's that to say that I can't? And the only person who can tell if I can or I can't is me. So I'll never know if I don't try, you know, you'll ever in anything, you know, if you, uh, if you just accept that you can't, then you can't, you're right. That, that old saying, if you think you can or you can't, you're right. You know, so the, the possibility of, oh, you'll never walk again. Okay. How do you know? I haven't tried to walk yet. Well, you just can't. Well, I, that's bogus material. That's bogus information because you have nothing to go on because I've never tried on this planet. So then yeah, taking that doctor and, okay, I know what you think. Let's go prove it. Um, and so maybe it's because I'm stubborn. Um, maybe it is that marine mentality that's in me. <coughs> I was, uh, I wasn't going to settle for just that's the way it is. Yeah. So that's seems really, ex at least to me, quite extraordinary. So was, was that uh, if you go back, I don't know, to, to, um, elementary school or somewhere back in, in your past, was that always the case? For example, have you been like the rebel in class or um, has this been a red line through whole, your whole life or did it start at some point? Yeah, it. I've, I don't want to say I was the rebel. I, I wasn't exactly the, a troublemaker per se or anything like that, but um, I definitely, I learned things the hard way. I will say that. Um, but I, that's the thing is I learn them. I don't ever just accept them. The world isn't, uh, there's nothing in the world that I just hear it and go, Oh, okay. That's what it is. I want to experience it. And I have, I've been like that ever since I was a kid. You know, you, you, you can't go through life in a, in a bubble. You're, you need to fall off the bike a few times before you learn how to ride it, before you learn how to, to keep the pedal moving so that you don't fall off and scrape your knees. Um, and that has always been the case. And, it, this is in the extreme of it as an adult, you know, you're right. I'm injured and I, it's hard to walk. So I've got to learn how to do it through the pain and through the struggles. And then eventually I get to where I'm land to go. You, you, you don't wake up as a kid one day and just, you're able to ride a bike. You had to fall a few times. You had to get scrapes. You needed the band-aids and you needed mom or dad to help you. And then once you did it, now you can do it every day without ever thinking about it. And that's how my injury was. And so you could basically continue uh, with always some kind of hope in there or like you knew that's going to work or was I definitely like, uh, knew you, you, the how? Knew. you just know I that's the thing is that it's just like faith. It's just in your gut. I just, you know, you can hope everybody hopes for something great to happen. But when you have the the tenacity of where your it's your life and you're going to choose how to live it then you know what your outcome is because you're not going to stop until you reach it it's not a matter of uh you know this could happen you know it's going to it might take longer in some cases but when you have that drive within you i'm not stopping till it's done until i've reached my goal then there's your answer you know that that's going to happen because you're not going to stop until it does so we're like from from the inner core really committed that this was going to be the the end goal that you will reach this no matter what yeah and, and even to this day you know i've i've achieved further than what the doctor said i ever would and um ever could but i still there's no there's no just comfort now it's not just oh i can take it easy no um, I was wearing braces, um, even, you know, up until last year or earlier this year, you know, I, I had to wear a brace practically every day just for the pain and the support because of what my pain. And now I'm, I'm able to work 
you know, and live endlessly without having to have a brace for support on my leg anymore. Um, and even now that the brace is off, it's maybe a, just for explanation of what exactly is the, the brace. Um, I, so after my leg healed, um, to a, an extent, you know, they said I'd never walk again. Well, being able to walk, um, the, muscles and tendons had still been completely destroyed. So it wasn't like I could just go for a, a 5k run all of a sudden. So, um, I had a brace that would help me in case anything would happen where if I fell, um, because the muscles could only bend about 70 to 75 degrees. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't squat all the way down. So if I fell and, um, my leg bent, I would end up tearing all of those tendons and muscles again. So the brace basically has a safety in it. So when you move too quickly, it locks. So that way your leg can't bend. So it helps protect from hyperextending um, the the mus or the muscle groups uh, within your leg. Um, and even just for general support of your MCL and things, it uh, it helped kind of support them. So they they weren't doing as much of the work. So I, I didn't hurt as much while I was working or walking because any amount of time was putting more stress on my leg. So that brace kind of helped alleviate some of the pain by helping support those muscles. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and you just trained all the way until you are where you are right now, right? Essentially, yeah. Just now it, it's it's all been essentially trial and error um you know going a couple of days with it a couple of days without um making sure that I, i'm paying attention to what my body tells me and you know i have i have family and my wife included who's you know where like you need you need to be careful you need to make sure that you're not going to hurt yourself or anything and i never i never blatantly do anything just because i'm i'm reckless and go no i'm not going to wear it the goal is not to but you still have to pay attention to it and do it in an intelligent way of listening to your body. It's going to tell you when it needs it and when it doesn't. So uh, I listened and I, I've gotten to the point now where I don't, I don't have to wear it um, every day. I don't have to, I haven't worn it in quite a while now. Actually, it's been a few months. And uh, what was the prediction of the doctors, what you were able to do after recovery? Um, well, the, originally I was initially told that I would never walk. And then when I kind of beat that, they said, okay, well, you'd never walk without assistance. Uh, that would be without a walker or a cane. Um, and then, uh, I, I've gotten to the point now where I, I don't have an aid to walk at all. Um, I, I could even go as far as to say I can jog or I can, I can walk very briskly. I can't run yet. I don't, I can't do a full sprint quite yet. Um, but that is, uh, not outside the realm of possibility. You can jog again. I can, I can go, wow. um, on a, I did it. We have been on a treadmill and I've gotten, um, for <laughs> roughly around five to six minutes, um, at, at a, br a brisk pace, um, uh, to a, a slight jog. Um, I, I have not gone further than that. Um, I, I've tried to maybe just for uh, a couple of times, try and burst of speed to see if I can even manage it. And I can't after about three steps, so I can't quite run, but, uh, definitely not out of, uh, not out of the question yet though, as for, uh, down the future. That, that is after hearing the, your injury of your leg, this sounds just super, extraordinary and almost impossible to do and, and a lot of people would think that then yeah. i i'm not a i'm not a doctor so i can't say that there's anything medically that was just you know a revelation that has caused that but um i just know that the determination is is that i'll i'll never quit attempting i'll never quit trying until either a i succeed or b i die oh wow that is that is very strong determination It's, it's the way that I think the world needs to be, you know, you, like I said, the only person that can make you quit is you. That, that is such a powerful thing to hear because at least for me, it seems quite often that when you encounter, um, 
people who supposedly went your uh, your path already or like authorities further in your way that you tend to listen to those if you can't do something like that or would be stupid to attempt this quite some people would i guess take the advice and like okay i maybe rather not try it yeah the the fact that somebody can say you can or can't do something i i, I almost I almost have no give them no merit because they're not me. How do they know? They might be, they may not be able to do it. And by all means, they know themselves better than anybody else, or at least they should know themselves better than anybody else. So if they say that, oh, you can't do this, really it means they can't do it. Doesn't mean you can't. They're not you. They're not in your mind. They don't know what your story is or what your life is. So the only person that can make the determination ever in any situation is going to be you. That is so true. I I really, I really want, for example, that is one of the important parts I want to push out to other people as well of like, they cannot start something or they cannot do something what they, I don't know, tell themselves or somebody else told them in somewhere in time that keeps people away from, usually doing what they really enjoy doing what they maybe if maybe it's uh, maybe it's even starting something like their own small business or it's something like they're starting their podcast um something like that it it's sometimes really sad to see that they just don't even try doing because some odds or just some hesitation is there and it's like okay then i don't do it because some small obstacles are they in the beginning of of the of the new way, and that's what I what I find really sad to see actually when this is happening that people pull themselves down in order maybe to not fail or to not have other people judge them because they started something and then failed or anything like that. So that's so interesting powerful to hear that from you especially after hearing your story that you had never thought of even even letting anybody else trying to determine your your end goal and like always trying to just just attempt it and see what happens i mean did you did you ever have um the smallest thought of uh if i like the judgment of others or like what others think if I uh, don't do this or um, something like that? No, I, um, I am a very opinionated person and I'm very blunt and bold about the things that I believe in and that I say. And that's one of those things is other people. Have, I'm again, you know, the only person that should hold any merit in their opinion about you is yourself. Um, and so whenever anybody I thought of, you know, somebody else would tell me, you know, or would think that I'm, uh, I'm crazy because I'm not listening to my doctors or anything. You can say, I don't care. They're not me. And I'm not going to let that determine who I am. Um, and so the, the idea of other people kind of dictating me or how I, I felt they would think about me. No, I, I, I was that way prior to the accident and even more so after the accident. It was just my focus was me, making sure that I I was getting my goals and doing what I needed to do in order for me to be happy. And I didn't I was kind of unconcerned about what anybody else would think about it. That's that's really awesome. And did you have on the way also maybe people supporting you to because I I can't imagine this on the whole way of your um, recovery is not all good days. And you also, I assume just, you had some, some lows and downs uh, where there's yeah. some people also to help you to get you back up. Yeah, I, I definitely, I had um, some close friends, um, Austin and Julia, um, and even their little daughter, Mila, she, um, being three or four at the time of my accident, um, they would come see me, um, multiple times a week. And 
just to have the type of personal connection where they didn't see me in my injury at all. The, whenever they would come, we never discussed my injuries. It was always about what Mila was doing in learning or paintings that she had drawn me. Or they were talking about, um, the, there was a water and aircraft show coming to Chicago is where I was doing my recovery at Chicago, um, Illinois here in America. And, we would go up to the sky deck and look out and we'd talk about, you know, the best place of where they were going to get seats that next weekend in order to see it. And so the, they treated me just as if they would any other day. There, there was no, no pity for me being in pain and there was no feeling sorry for me. And they, they at the same time had the mentality, you know, with me that I, I was me regardless of what, my injuries were, my injuries weren't, whether I recovered in one fashion or another. Um, and the, the amount of just love and that, that really uplifts you no matter what, you know. And I had days where, you know, I was on so many painkillers and opiates and muscle relaxers in order to try and drown out the amount of pain my body was in. And I, I just didn't want to do that anymore. Even though I may not have been in pain, I it was difficult to to function intellectually. You couldn't you couldn't truly have a clear train of thinking. Um, and I, I didn't just want to be a zombie that just didn't feel pain. And so I, I cut all of my painkillers and everything. Um, and my body ended up going into shock from it. And, um, I had to go into the hospital for another, um, three days to get pumped with fluids and things because my body, um, was, uh, addicted to them. Even though mentally I wasn't, my body quite literally was. It was craving those, those opiates and painkillers. And so, um, I had rough days, but you, for you sure. You from one I, day to the other with all the painkillers? Yep. Solid. Cold turkey. I was on, I was oh, on a hundred wow. micrograms of fentanyl. I was on, um, double doses of Norco, um, twice a day. I had doses of Valium, doses of Baclofen. Um, and I, I just couldn't do it. I was done. So I quit cold turkey single day. Um, they sent me to the hospital. They said I wasn't going to die, but you know, your body, it, it felt like it. I will say that. And, uh, my, my very first day out after that, Austin and Julia came to see me and he, uh, he brought a deck of cards, um, to come play because it was the first time I had a, a clear enough head that I could play gin rummy. I could play a card game with him. Um, because so that, you know, I, I couldn't think, I couldn't really comprehend, um, that type of, that train of thinking. But I remember that, that very first day afterwards and it was, it was the single greatest thing that he could have done because, Hey, not only am I off the meds, but Hey, you're gonna you're gonna do what you set out to do, and he brought me that deck of cards. I remember that. But from that day on, you probably also had pain basically all the time, right? I still do. Um, and the the pain comes and goes in the style. My nerves and my body are so damaged um, that there is the general kind of aches and pains that come with the injury. Um, but they're also excuse me. There are also other days where the, those nerve endings are kind of healing, um, essentially. And so all of a sudden where there wasn't a pain receptor, all of a sudden there's a really strong one. Um, so you can get some very intense kind of out of the blue, um, uh, pains and the stabbing feelings and even the sensations. And I have places on my leg where I don't have feeling at all. And then just a hair next to them, I have hypersensitivity. Um, so even putting clothes on and clothes off, um, and the way that it rubs my leg can cause severe pain and things too. So, um, it's, it's something I have to live with every day. And, um, I have, uh, in a mild painkiller that's opiate free. Um, so no more opiates at all, um, that I can take as needed, um, to help manage on some of the days where I'm longer, um, where I'm on my feet, but, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't do, any more um, Norco fan. I won't do any of that. If it's got opiates in it at all, I, I won't do them. But still all the, all the pain is um, not, or at least it seems so, so difficult to imagine. They have basically all the day, uh, all day long or basically every day pain, which is, 
I guess also nagging on on your psyche a bit when you have all the day, all day long the pain. How can you deal with that all the time? The the biggest thing when it comes to that pain is you know the, the way I explain it to people is you know generally doctors will make you describe all right what is your pain on a scale of one to ten and for most people what they would consider a seven or eight that's my day to day that's my baseline you know I don't that's what I live with um, what truly you know I don't necessarily ignore the pain. That's not really possible. It, it's going to let you know that it's there, but um, I just know that I'm, even though I'm in pain, it's for a better reason. You know, I, even after this, I've, I'm married and I can come home to my wife and I can sit down and enjoy a television show and have a conversation with her. I'm not just some vegetable in a bed that she has to come take care of. So I can I can be in pain all day, but at least I get to hear my wife laugh and I can comprehend that she's laughing. I'm not just uh, uh, the guy in the bed she's got to take care of. Wow. But then you have already like such a different perspective that you can really look at those things that I that are real, really essential and meaningful for you. Like this, that laugh of your wife instead of um, looking at the pain. So I assume you shifted already your, your mind in the direction that you just focus on the things you can do and can see and can comprehend and can feel rather than the pain, which is constant there. They, the things that in the world that matter are what make the pain worth it. I know that I can't make the pain disappear. I can do what I can just like in my injury, you know, you'll never walk. I can do things in order to walk again. So even though I can't essentially make my, my nerves disappear, I can do things that make the pain disappear just emotionally. So I, I do, I live with pain and there, there are days where it's tough for me to walk up the stairs and there as times where even just because I work on compacted concrete or things like that, that, you know, I feel it in my shins and in my kneecap, but I can think about the pain and complain and whine and make my wife listen to that. Um, or, you know, the dogs want to go for a walk and go, sorry, boys, I can't do that with you today because daddy's leg hurts. Um, or I can come home and I can think about, Oh, you know, I've got two dogs that as soon as you walk in the door, it's the happiest moment of their lives in order to see me. Um, or, you know, I have this job that now allows me to spend every night and every weekend with my wife where that wasn't always the case. And, you know, I can, I can actually come in and I can hold her and we can go to dinner and there we want to go, um, to see a movie or a show or to the ballet or something. I, I can comprehend that. I can drive the vehicle. I can spend that time with her. Um, where before, you know, I was, I was dependent on every other human being around me in order to change my clothes and to get me out of a hospital bed and to get me to a bathroom and need to shower me because I couldn't bend or move my legs because of everything I was in. I have so, so much more to be grateful for that you know, the little pains and aches that I have, I manage them as best I can, but they, they won't bother me. They will definitely not. I will not succumb to letting them run or control anything. That sounds like a really, really healthy mindset for, for the situation you were in. Was that something you adopted during your injury or has that always been there before as well? I think the injury a lot made me focus much more on those things and how I can gain joy and not let some of the other things stress me as much. Um, you know, everybody likes to say that they, you know, they, their life is perfect and they're always happy or people like to say that they're not going to let uh, the job dictate them or money or things like that. But in the end, you know, everybody has to work. Everybody has bills they need to pay. And, you know, there are stresses about that, that, get in the way and the people are just so unhappy and I I'm I'm still a human I still get stresses and there's still things at work that 
you know, irritate me and I wish were different or, you know, there's a boss that might push you the wrong way or there might be a time where my wife and I, we don't get along. But in the end, no matter what, I know that my mindset has has adapted to where I, I focused on what truly is important and the happiness that I can I can get from that mindset. I never felt before before my accident. I, I didn't. I didn't think of the my life as being as happy as it is. You know, I, I love that my dogs now. You know that they love to see me when I walk in the door. But now, when it happens, you do you stop for a moment and you comprehend it and you see the sincerity in the situation. And like you know, this is this is a moment where there is a being in the world that is happier than anything else just because I exist to them. And when, when you take that extra two seconds to really be insightful about your, your life, you'd be amazed at the amount of joy you can bring to yourself. That's that there's no, there's nobody else doing that. It's not somebody buying you a gift. It's not a mentor that's giving you the, the keys to the success in life. That's you yourself just taking a moment to think about your life and, uh, be insightful on it. And you'd be amazed at all the things you can find in your life that you find amazing that bring you joy. Oh, wow. That sounds like really, really good, even though you had this injury. So like really interesting that you build up this, this mindset for yourself, um, even though you have constant pain and on a scale like eight or seven or eight. So that, that seems really, um, yeah, really insane almost to me. I, I wouldn't say that I like, I don't even say that I can brag that, you know, I don't, I think that's, everybody's capable of that. Every human being in this yes. world is capable of that. It's, it might be so unheard of because, you know, not everybody goes through a traumatic accident like myself, you know, not, not everybody gets run over by a truck. And the same thing when you have individuals that not, not everybody gets cancer, you know, so they have their own story and their own evolved to go through it. But just because you haven't had this, this, disease that is so terrifying or you haven't had an injury that's life-threatening um or you haven't had an event in your life that's been traumatic emotionally all of those might be catalysts to make people think that they can do those things finally but they could do them in the first place nothing nothing about who they are as a human being as a soul changed so anybody out there in the world can have that same mindset of anyone you know, you could have a 15 year old kid who is getting bullied can have that same mindset as far as a, a 75 year old retiree who doesn't have any children left in the world. They, they both can have the exact same mindset and be happy and joyful and succeed at whatever it is that they want to. Everybody who is listening until now, rewind and listen to that, that part again. I think that is so powerful what you just said. That's really, I, I see it the same way. That would be so awesome if some would adopt those those things a bit more so I'm not waiting for this injury to happen to finally change in the direction. Um, yeah. So thank you for, for saying that. It's, I think, really, yeah. really strong. I, um, I believe in it. I, I really feel that, that you, you do. Um, and was there maybe something, um, else what you took out of this, this injury, um, what, yeah, you didn't have before, like any, any um, positive or, I mean, this tell you the truth, coming out of the injury in just a blunt form that I, I didn't have before was just an appreciation for who I am. You know, uh, before I felt I was very, uh, I was a cog in, in the wheel of life. I, I, I didn't have a purpose, so to say. Um, I was, I was doing the same thing. I'd go to work, make money, pay bills, go to work, pay money, make money, pay bills. And I didn't, I didn't feel that there was a purpose to truly who I was as a human being on this earth. And when I, after this accident and having the determination to, to be, me to be what I set out and what I wanted. It made me realize just how wrong I was to have lived that way. 
and that there there was purpose the whole time, but I just was never applying it. I never and that and it was on me. It's entirely my choice. It was the reason why anything my life was where I was at because of me. Nobody else, nothing else. You could blame it on anything of oh, I didn't have this education or I didn't take that job opportunity or whatever it may be. But those were my choices. So. I learned that if I'm going to do anything in in life at all, I have to make sure I'm the one who's doing it, not just wait around for it. So basically, it it gave you some kind of new perspective on your life, on your per, on the purpose of of your life. This accident. Yep, absolutely. But w would you go that far on saying that? Uh, It ha the accident, which seemed just so tremendous, actually had po really positive um, impacts on your life uh, after. Oh, absolutely. The I I don't think I could be as happy or as I couldn't have the same successful, joyful mindset that I have without it. Um, in that that this tremendous injury that's supposed to be so traumatizing and so detrimental to who I was, um, it's kind of the opposite. It was a catalyst to truly bring my life full circle and into, um, <laughs> I mean, without my accident, I would never have met my wife. Um, I would have never moved um, out to, to where we live now. I would never have a job that I currently have. Um, And I wouldn't have the mindset that I currently have. So the, this terrible thing turned out to be one of the greatest blessings I've ever had. Such a controversial thing to say right now after, after listening to your story. But it's so awesome to hear that you see it as such. Yeah. Like I said before, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. right. And that's the same thing. Yeah, I can either think of it as a trauma or think of it as a blessing. If I think of it as a blessing, then I'm right. And uh, where are you right now? You said you have a job and basically <laughs> working full time again. I am. I'm working full time. Um, uh, we have prospects of uh, potential um, even even long, larger scale uh, of um, my job. Uh, I work 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday. Um, the company that I work for, um, I'm a marketing director, like I said, and uh, we have a huge potential for growth out in the business world. So it's not just a monotonous job. There's going to be a lot of change and a lot of growth um, and a lot of responsibility in the future. Sounds like a really good, um, yeah, looking something to look forward to in the next years, I assume. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But uh, du during the basically during the the time you in the last years, what was maybe the uh, a sentence or a person that was most influential to you and helped you to get into this this kind of mindset? Oh man. The, I mean, tell you the truth, the, the biggest one phrase that has always stuck with me came from my friend Austin. Um, and it's when we were working together and he, he had this phrase about, um, when you, you work at something, you don't just come to be this mediocre piece of it. You, you come to, to really shine. He used to say that, uh, We didn't come to take part. We came to take over. And that's how I, that's how you have to think about your own life. You're not there just to be a part of your, your own being and your own life. You're there to be in charge of it. You're there to take over it and, and truly dictate how you're going to live and who you're going to be. And, uh, so even though his reference was toward business, I, I can completely, it just reminisces. And uh, when I reminisce about it, it just resonates with me that it's, you know, it's about you yourself too. You're, you're not just there to be uh, this zombie, but just going part through your own life. You need to grip it and take charge of it. Oh, wow. That's, that's really powerful. Thank you. Um, and yeah. then uh, maybe to, for the, for the qu closing questions, um, I still have, 
what I usually ask whether you um, can relate to The Ambitious Sloth, so the name of the podcast, um, and uh, what does it like mean to you or does it have any, any value or meaning? I, it does. The the idea behind it, I think it resonates very true with my my personality. You know, and this ambitious aspect of a sloth, you know, never, even though a sloth moves extremely slow and keep getting from point A to point B, um, they're not giving up. They're doing what their minds set out to do. You know, they're getting from point A to point B, no matter how long it takes them in any way, shape or form. Um, and that's, that's how my mindset was too. You know, I'm going to succeed. I don't care how long it takes me, what I have to go through, I'm going to get there. And so that, uh, you know, some people might call it an ironic, you know, that it's an ambitious thought, but I, it's not ironic at all. It's honest. It's true you know, that you can have a very ambitious thought. I see it the same way. <laughs> um, and do you have, uh, still something, after telling basically all of your insights already, something um, to still, what do you still want to share to other people? What if they, what do you think would be helpful for them? Like any, any quote sentence or what you want others to, um, to keep in mind? Yeah. They, uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm taking this quote from somebody. I don't know who it is, but it, it sat with me is that, uh, If, uh, if you think you can do the job or if you think you can't do it anyway, figure out how to do it along the way. So just because you're not sure whether you can or you can't do something, don't run from it. Try. Just go for it. Um, because you're going to learn something. You're either going to learn what your limits are. You're going to learn that you could do something that you didn't know you could do before, or you're going to learn how not to do something. Not that you failed and couldn't succeed. You just couldn't succeed it in the way that you attempted. Um, so it teaches you to change and to learn. So, um, but, uh, definitely no matter what it is, whether it be like you've mentioned before, you know, whether it be starting a business or overcoming an injury, in, in, an injury or even playing an instrument that you've never played before. You know, if you're not sure if you can or can't try. Thank you. And is there this, is there any chance, um, that maybe a, a person who listened to that can contact you, maybe like ask you another question if they have? Yeah. Um, I'm available on, uh, social media, uh, easiest way I'm probably guessing internationally is probably Facebook or Instagram. Um, on Instagram, I'm USMC or bearded USMC. Uh, I can know if you can tell I've got a beard. I don't know if anybody's listening. They obviously can't see me. Um, but, uh, I'm called bearded and then USMC for United States Marine Corps, um, on Instagram. Um, you can also find me on Facebook by my name, Dennis McCormick. Um, if you also search that, um, Instagram name on Facebook, my name should pop up as well. All right. Thank you so much for taking your time after work, uh, with me to have this chat. Yeah, no problem. I'm, uh, Thank you for staying up. I know there's a big time difference, so I appreciate your, your dedication. No problem at all. Thank you so much. No problem. You take care. So I guess that's basically then this for the podcast. I'm really, really okay. glad that you uh, took the time. And thank you for sharing your whole story. It was really yeah, amazing. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Anytime anybody's ever got questions, I'm happy to tell them. I'm sure some people will be inspired by that. Good. Even if it's just one person, that's enough. That's also what I say always. Yeah. Thank you so much. And no have problem, a nice man. evening still with uh, your wife as well and your dogs. You as well, man. Get some sleep. <laughs> I do, I do. No worries about me. Good.